the Hurricane Dora totally passes to the south of us, is contained, and we're not anywhere within the weather pattern of it. So this, this, this is the hurricane anomaly. that just uh, took place. Uh, that has Correct. been created. This is the hurricane. And in this area to the north up here, above it, the cloud cover is broken into a bunch of little fragments. So instead of being a nice cloud cover, this area is like all broken up into pieces and it starts to flicker and glisten and vibrate like there's frequencies or vibrations being added to it. That something I've never seen before, you know, this broad of an area where that happens. So at this point here is where it starts to happen. I'll back it up a little and you can see, and hopefully it comes through in your screenshot, this area here with this whole like frequency pattern. At this point, right about here, this this is universal time up here, but we're 10 hours earlier than that. So at around seven o'clock universal time, uh, Hawaii time is when suddenly the winds happen. So for two days before this, we had some really strong winds and a crazy haze that was all across the island. Everyone was like, what is this haze? And that's when this anomaly right here was coming over. And right here at this point is when suddenly the winds pick up and we get these 70 mile an hour gusty winds uh, hitting Lahaina side, which is Lahaina is usually, you know, it's in the opposite side of the trade winds. It's usually protected by the West Maui mountains from winds. But here suddenly the winds shifted, went around the mountain and concentrated and hit Lahaina with this an incredible wind. And people try to say it was Hurricane Dora, but that's way down here completely, you know, with a calm layer of clouds between us. You've seen cymatics where you put a frequency of, on water or rice and it makes this flickering sound like little mandalas. That's kind of what I'm seeing at this point right here. This is moving very quickly up here and that's the point where the winds hit Hawaiian islands. Do we have the ability to run frequencies on clouds? Yes, we do. We have the technology, it's called HARP, High Energy Active Oral Research Program. A lot of people know it as the original HARP antennas of Alaska, which were decommissioned and made obsolete because now they got little ones. We actually have a HARP dome, a boat that sometimes comes in Honolulu Harbor that's got a big dome on it that's called the HARP dome. Was this that? I don't know. Uh, this needs to be a part of the investigation. This weird frequency anomaly up here creating this cymatic pattern, waves of winds hitting Hawaii up. It subsided after that, and then we're back to our normal, you know, cloud, tropospheric trade wind cloud cover hitting us while Hurricane Dora goes on, Dora goes on its merry way down the ocean. So this is something corporate media, as you point out, has just been talking about the hurricane as the inciting event, the unusual mm -hmm. weather anomaly, but you're you're making it very clear to all of us. If you're that far away from the epicenter and from the, those uh, disruptive swirls, you're not getting a whole lot of weather in my experience. I agree, this seems, it certainly is not consistent with the narrative that's being promoted. It doesn't seem to be the hurricane itself was the driver. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to add too that for usually small hurricanes, the radius of wind coverage is about 50 miles. For real large hurricanes, it's 150. Right now, we're, we're, what Bruce is showing is that the hurricane, when the winds really hit, was about 500 miles away. So again, this brings in great questions as to what the mainstream media is reporting as the cause. This podcast is really a, uh, a starting point for asking questions and initiating investigations. And we have now, uh, you've now presented evidence uh, demonstrating that the leading theory that this was associated with Dora directly and the, the uh, winds typical of hurricanes within a 50 mile radius, it just doesn't hold water based on the actual evidence you're sharing. Another major cause that they're citing is climate change or global warming. So Bruce, do you want to share some of that information about the temperatures that we are dealing with? Uh, yeah, it's... Um... You know, we uh, went to main mainstream sources here and uh, pulled out what the weather history was. You know, minimum, maximum temperature and mean temperature is, of course, what's most important. And we see 2023, the mean temperature was on 80 degrees. 1965, it was 82 degrees. 1953, it was 76 degrees. So it's all up and down from 80 degrees is the mean temperature. 1946, 81 degrees. If you look at that over a period of time, you know, through all the years and what is the, the mean temperature right here, you can see it's always been fluctuating right around 80 degrees. It goes up a little, it goes down a little. There, there's certainly no pattern of global warming. We've had the same, we've had hotter temperatures in other years. If you look at it by the decades right here, this is the average for the decade of 1960, 70, 80, 90. You can see the average for the decade was holding strong, right? 80 degrees, went up to 81 degrees in 2000, down to 79 degrees, up to 81 degrees in 2022 for the, this decade. Um, this is from Weather Underground. This is, you know, mainstream source for where these numbers come from. The whole idea that there's global warming, you know, at least for island of Maui, uh, or even Lahaina, doesn't hold any water. There is no global warming when you actually look at the data straight on. So as I, I go through this, you can just see the level of devastation. There were, again, the one of the telltale signs is white ash left everywhere, which is not also normal. The level of destruction has been incredible. It's like a bomb hit. There were uh, over 2,200 structures that were destroyed, and 86% of these were local homes. Right now, um, they're, they're doing investigation in terms of uh, body count. Only 25% of the site has been gone through at this point in time. They just brought in uh, 20 dogs to find corpses. Uh, it's The death toll is at 106. A lot of people have been incinerated, basically, uh, and cremated in this process, so there's not many remains, so it's becoming a very difficult job to find out then uh, close as can and identify the bodies. So if you look at uh, when steel starts to melt, we're, we're talking a temperature range at about 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and then if you look at glass, it's about 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit. But notice that, again, look at how this house is totally intact, and this car here is fried, and glass is melted. So again, 
uh, it leaves questions as to how this type of destruction could have happened. But yet, even in those intense fires, we found that plastic was still remaining intact, like this little plastic piggy bank here. Uh, we were talking to people yesterday when we went over to Lahaina, and their little plastic flower pots were totally fine and intact, while everything else in steel melted around. So again, that leaves a characteristic of the fire that needs to be questioned. And as we go further down here and we look at the next, this whole characteristic is that notice all the trees that are standing and how all the houses have been burnt to a crisp and uh, how everything has been fairly leveled, uh, except for the concrete around the, those buildings. So what would be able to actually incinerate at that level, at that temperature, and yet still have trees remaining? And then if you look here, though, there's a whole line yeah. where this, the very back of the car is burnt, not, and, and the front is not touched. And this whole building is, is totally destroyed. And then it just cuts across here as if there was some type of beam that just went across here and then melted the steel along here. So again, it just leaves questions. And, and it spared the power pole and the transformer. That's bizarre. That's right. And, and so, so again, uh, these strange things of having, again, parts uh -huh. of vehicles melted up front and the latter part hardly touched, again, leaves questions that is not part of a normal fire that we'd see. Another thing that's very interesting is that there were some homes and some properties that it seemed like the fire went totally around. All of this here is totally destroyed all around this whole place. And when you look at the high winds that we had, it makes no sense why these structures here would be spared. But again, we see that uh, in several occasions uh, throughout the whole burn site. And another thing that, another characteristic that leaves a lot of questions are these boats that were offshore. And that's another question that, that uh, again, gets to be raised. Now this is very, uh, this type of event has occurred in other places. So if you, we look at some of the fires that happened, like Paradise Fire here in California, we see that these trees all are standing, but yet all of these trailers, everything totally disintegrated into a white ash. Again, in Malibu, uh, there was a large area, again, had the same characteristics of those fires. And again, questions were, were raised whether they were some type of energy weapon that was used in order to uh, start these fires and to spread the fires also. If we look at what is being promoted by mainstream media. And, I, and that's why we had to get out and we had to say something because this is what mainstream media is saying are the main causes, especially global warming. We're right. getting that all over the place. Why we have to have carbon taxes and why we have to have these lockdowns in terms of energy you know, consumption and all this other stuff. So this is, uh, again, when we look though at the characteristics, one of the areas that they don't allow here, as soon as you mention directed energy weapons, right away, you're seen as a conspiracy theorist, as a nut, as a wacko, someone who is stirring up the pot where it doesn't need to be stirred. So, but we need this in the investigation. I'm just gonna put that out as, as, as why it's so important at the onset, because right now people are very open. There's a lot of emotions that are being stirred. And that's a time when, when you can really uh, actually uh, establish some subconscious beliefs about a situation when the emotions are very high and things are very stirred and people are trying to make some sense out of it. So again, I think that this has to be considered and when they do their investigations to really seriously look at then these characteristics of these fires. And that's all I have to say about that.